I don't think I would have had that courage if I wouldn't have got the clarity from the one event that I talk about in the book is when they said, call us mom and pop. I was able to plant my flag, have another binding anxiety and turn it into action and go, I'm binding this. No, I'm not calling you mom and dad. I have a mom and dad. I go, thank you for thinking of me that way. <laughs> it's very polite. And I felt I need to contextualize that. I went, and they're still alive. <laughs> <laughs> it's not unlike being hit on by someone and being like, I appreciate you'd like to have sex with me, but I have a girlfriend and she's alive. <laughs> it's my and Bialik's breakdown. She's going to break it down for you. Because you know she knows a thing or two. And now she's going to break down. It's a breakdown. She's going to break it down. All right, all right, all right. I'm Ryan Bialik and welcome to my breakdown. The place where we break things down. So you don't have to. It's a very exciting day. We've had a lot of very exciting days. But first, I'd like to introduce you to the most grateful man I've ever met, Jonathan Cohen. Hi, my I'm, I'm not sure about the cadence of that opening. All right, all right, all right. All right. <laughs> no? Still no. Still no. That's right. We are going to have Matthew McConaughey on today to talk with us. I don't even want to read this man's bio because he's Matthew McConaughey. He's amazing. You should he... read his bio. Also, I should have been introduced as the most dazed and confused man. <laughs> that goes without saying. Or the Lincoln lawyer, Jonathan um, Cohen. I don't even know what to say. This is like legit a person who I don't even know if he knows who I am or who you are. He definitely doesn't know who I am. Okay. I don't know what favor we did or who owed who what to get this man on our show. But my publicist, Heather Bezignano, is from Texas, and I think this was her thing. So, Heather, thank you. He's an Academy Award winner. This is his book, Green Lights, which is a really, really um, visually lovely, fun, interesting, really journey through his life. There's all these pictures. He mostly doesn't have a shirt on, which I think is a thing Jonathan will talk about later. Academy Award winner Matthew McConaughey is a married man, a father of three, and a loyal son and brother. He considers himself a storyteller by occupation. He thinks it's okay to have a beer on the way to the temple, feels better with a day's sweat on him, and is an, an aspiring orchestral conductor. He has a foundation that he founded with his wife, Camilla, uh, called the Just Keep Living Foundation. He's a professor. He's got many things he does. He's also an owner of um, Austin FC. He also co-created his favorite bourbon. And yes, he's the Lincoln guy. But he he's, sold more Lincolns than any <laughs> other person. He's been in a ton of movies. And I've seen some of them, and we're going to talk about it. I just, we want to just get right into it. Make sure to follow us on Instagram. If you like this, d d go ahead and like it, subscribe. Let's talk to Matthew McConaughey. What? Break it down. So, <laughs> do you have any idea who we are? <laughs> I have somewhat of an idea. Well, we can't believe that you're here talking to us. And I was thinking, wh what favor did he have to do to come <laughs> speak to us? Uh, did they do any favors? Is there something I don't know about, Jonathan? Do you know anything about that maybe I did that I don't know that I did? It was a long campaign. It was pressure from all sides to get him here. We had uh, deep-seated uh, spies in Texas <laughs> gathering dirt. Damn it, you <laughs> got me. And I didn't even know what it was. That's what I assumed. So where do we begin? I read this book. It's called Green Lights. And um, not, not surprised that it is a number one New York Times bestseller. You know, one of the things that kind of struck me is um, it is not a classic memoir, you know, in the in the sense that that people often think of a memoir. Um, it really is kind of a, a journey into your journey, as it were. And um, I, I guess I wanted to sort of start <laughs> with these two wet dreams you had. Yeah, thank goodness for them. <laughs> I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you right now if I didn't have those two wet dreams. That's man. true. Now... The dream, you, you had two dreams that sent you on two separate and very specific journeys in your life. Yeah. Was it the same dream twice? That's the, that's why. Right. It's the same dream. Exact same dream. I had this dream in 1993. Whoa, I woke up. That was a wet dream. Boy, the elements of that dream do not add up to a typical wet dream. What was that about? Oh, okay. Okay, another thing that I related to you with, because I sometimes have dreams like that, but they're not sexual. It's just like a thing and it's happening. But none of them hey, take me the places you're away with it right? as long as we can. It's, it's so weird. Okay, go ahead. I shut up. So now. then I have the dream again, exact same dream, exact same outcome. Frame, the dream was the exact same frame for frame, 11 seconds, bam. 
Well, it's the second time that I go in 1996, four years later, that I go, whoa. Hmm. That was the exact same dream, the same outcome. That's a sign. That's telling me something. I got to chase that down. That's when I went off and chase down Peru because the two things in the dream were the Amazon River and African tribesmen. And that was my geographical point. So then I think my dream's over. I've chased it down. Cut to three years later, 1999, I had the dream the third time, which tells me I got to chase down the second half, which was the African tribesmen. And I haven't had it since. If I have it again. You might have it tonight, Matthew. You might have it tonight. I hope so. (laughs) But if I have it again, I don't know what the hell I'll be chasing. I'm just going to sit back and enjoy it. Revel in the post. Well, and one of one of the other things that I really liked about your book and also kind of about your perspective is you come from a religious consciousness that's very infused in kind of your the culture that you grew up in, meaning it's mm. not overtly uh, it's not overtly Christian. It's not overtly dogmatic. You have a lot of appreciation for a lot of different practices and a lot of different kind of traditions. But, you know, this kind of experience is a is a very mystical, spiritual, you know, profound experience. And. I mean, in, in another culture, in another time, we would call you a prophet. So was there some element that you felt of, like, personal prophecy or, like, how, how yeah, how do you kind of frame yeah. that? I took it as a direct line to, from, from the world, the prime mover, the way maker, whatever we want to call it, the uncaused cause, whatever. I took it as a direct line of truth, a lightning bolt that was saying, I knew it was specific. And only for me, and originally for me, I knew that this was not something I was going to go share. Hey, have you ever had this dream with this outcome? I knew it was an original experience that I had. Um, No one had said, hey, one day you might have this dream. And if you do listen to it, it was mine and mine only. And my, so I sat there and after the second time said, okay, what, I got to listen to this. I got to heed this call. I've never had something so specific. If the dream would have been similar to the first one with the same outcome, I probably wouldn't have done anything about it, but it shook my floor because it took me back to the time I had the first dream and it was exactly every detail, every frame. I remember it's 11 frames, like a movie. One second, two second, three. And I remember all the angles, 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 11 of them, 11 seconds, ejaculation, wake up. Whoa, hey, how about that? What was that little kiss? Was that for me? (laughs) (laughs) Sure, (laughs) that little kiss was, wow. You know, going, all the elements of that dream sound like a nightmare. But they weren't. They were the opposite. Ooh, okay. Huh. Flip the script on that. I like this version. Um, so then what is it? Yeah, that's why That's that's why I chased it. And did I feel like it was a, yeah, a prophetic call for me to go follow? Yes. What, what other, have you had other specific, you know, feelings like that? Actually, I was, I was interviewed this morning and I was asked to identify some of the most spiritual experiences I've ever had. And mm. I had my second son at home. Um, and I remember that was a very, very, um, singular, mystical, spiritual, like transcendental kind of experience. Are, are there other things that you've experienced like that? You know, are you a person that you feel like, oh, I'm in touch with something, I have access to that, or it just kind of drops in? Uh, I mean, look, I've had different original, particular, singular experiences on usually on my own when I'm off on one of those trips where mm-hmm. I've put myself in a place so that those truths can land, mm-hmm. you know, and you can hear them. Like I say, though, they, they hit you. It's like soft as a butterfly, but it's a fucking lightning bolt at the same time. And you go, Whoa, I can't unwrite that. Mm-hmm. That's, that's talking to me. And I need to, I need to heed that. I look first child born. Mm-hmm. That was a biggie for me. Um, I became, I remember I was like to myself, I was like, I just became immortal. Mm. Biologically, so, but even more than that, I was like, okay, this is it. This is what I've dreamed of being all my life. Not immortal, but a father. And here we go. Um, I've had, look, I don't know why I cry at birth and not death. I don't know why I cry when I hear the story about the the, the person getting out of jail that was uh, wrongly prosecuted and finds his freedom, but I don't cry at the death of something. The birth, springtime of things just light me up, and that's... uh, um, so, and, and I've been told that's odd. <laughs> I look around and no one else is crying. And then they're, when they're at the funeral, I'm not crying. Um, and maybe that's me. Uh, maybe that is part of the faith belief as well. Cause I don't mm-hmm. think it's over in this life. Although I don't know, I believe it's not. And um, so something about like, oh, great. 
not happy for that person to be leaving physically, but there we go. Congratulations. Mm -hmm. My MB Alex Breakdown is supported by BetterHelp. If you're feeling depressed, if you're struggling with uncertainty, if you're having difficulty sleeping, I think it's time for BetterHelp. BetterHelp offers online professional counselors who can listen and help you. They assess your needs and they match you with your own professional therapist who you can start talking to in under 48 hours. This is not a crisis line. It's not self-help. It is professional counseling done securely online. BetterHelp is committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches. It is easy and free to change counselors if needed, and it's more affordable than traditional offline counseling, and financial aid is available. We love BetterHelp. It really can make a difference to see someone online, especially if you've been hesitant to try therapy before. Our podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com and get 10% off your first month of online therapy. Betterhelp.com slash break. That's betterhelp.com slash break. Join the over 1 million people who've taken charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced BetterHelp professional. My MB Alex Breakdown is supported by Rothy's. It's 2021, and you know what, Jonathan? No one has time for uncomfortable shoes, especially me. And that's where Rothy's comes in. Rothy's surveyed thousands of customers. The number one word that was used to describe their shoes is comfy. What makes them so comfy? Well, they are seamless, literally. Their unique seamless design is very comfortable the moment you put them on. Their fan favorite styles are sustainably made with materials like Plastic water bottles. That's right. They take plastic water bottles and they make shoes out of them. They're also machine washable. They come in tons of shapes, styles, and colors, and you can always find the right one for you. I'm really enjoying the little booties, and I have them in a very interesting color. It's like a like a burnt sienna. Rothy's newly launched men's shoes, and that's really awesome. They are intentionally designed with an artisanal level of detail that our men need and created with nearly zero waste. They're durable, washable, and better for the planet. Pop Sugar named Rothy's one of the most comfortable and cute flats you'll never tire of wearing. No wonder Rothy's best-selling shoe, I've owned it, The Point in Black has over 5,000 near-perfect reviews. Step up your summer wardrobe with washable, sustainable, stylish shoes and bags from Rothy. Head to rothys.com slash breakdown to find your new warm weather favorites today. That's R-O-T-H-Y-S dot com slash breakdown. My MB Alex Breakdown is supported by Organifi. Mmm, Organifi. Organifi is a line of organic superfood blends that offer plant-based nutrition and less than three grams of sugar. They choose high-quality plant-based ingredients for optimal health. Each superfood blend is easy and convenient to use. You mix it with water or your favorite beverage when you're on the go, and you get quality nutrition throughout your day. And at less than $3 a day, they keep their prices pretty low. Start your day with Organifi Green Juice. That's what I like to do. It contains essential superfoods that reset your brain for a great start to your day. Organifi Red Juice is a superfood berry blend that promotes energy with zero caffeine. Organifi Complete Protein is something I love as a vegan. It has not only a multivitamin and digestive enzymes, but 20 grams of protein in one easy to mix shake. And Organifi Gold is a superfood tea that helps promote rest and relaxation, a healthy immune response, and a healthy response to stress. Go to Organifi.com slash break to receive 20% off your purchase. That's O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I dot com slash break for 20% off your purchase. You describe a really interesting time that you had. Um, was it the year between high school and college? When you went to Australia? Oh, Australia, I bet you love that story. I, I loved a lot of things about that story. So, um, you know, you're, you're a very adventurous spirit, and I know that sounds really trite, but, you know, really so much of your life, you know, as, as you tell it, has been marked by, I mean, you kind of call them green lights, you know, but sort of finding, finding openings, you know, where sometimes things have seemed mm -hmm. closed. You know, I, I think that sounds like it was an element of your personality, but this particular experience you had in Australia. My favorite part of the story, I think, was your description about getting there, where you're picturing, you're like, I'm going to have this great time in Australia, and, like, the car just keeps going. And it's like you described all the kinds of roads you drive on before you just get to <laughs> shitty dirt. 
<laughs> it's like you just kept going and the population signs kept getting smaller and smaller. And, you know, I mean, there's a lot of humor to it. But, you know, as someone trained as a neuroscientist and someone who's been really immersed in mental health and, you know, I grew up with mental illness also in my home. And so, you know, what I heard and what I saw was an unraveling you know, that you went through at a very critically important time in your life. And, you know, you're you're kind of not just because you're you're many people's image of like the American man. You have to understand my grandparents were about three feet tall and three feet wide. And you embody like America to us. Like we came from the shtetls to meet men like this, you know? So like I picture you, you know, like ready to have this journey in Australia, but you're you know, your 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 transition from high school to college was also one of tremendous challenge. Yeah. And you ended up, I mean, you took on a very interesting strict vegetarian diet because you said you yeah. craved discipline. You were depressed, my friend, and you were trying to make sense of insanity. I needed some measurement of achievement a day and eating that head of lettuce with a half a bottle of Heinz ketchup pulled up, poured over it. Um, gave me a sense of accomplishment to run those six miles a day, even though I was losing all the weight, gave me a sense of accomplishment right. to say out to be celibate yet still go masturbate in the bathtub every night. Gave me a sense of accomplishment. Right. I needed these sort of measuring sticks to have, go. I did that today. I followed through on that right. because the my world was chaos. Right. Well, that's and we call that binding anxiety. I mean, you were finding all sorts of ways to kind of make it make sense. Uh, I don't mean to get all, you know, fancy on you, but, you know, it's like finding anxiety. Finding anxiety. She yes. loves a good label. I love I love a good label. I do too. There's a tremendous courage to you. Like there's all these situations that you found yourself in, especially as a young man, where you kind of asserted this courage that kind of seems like it was driven from some other power in you. Meaning when you had to ask to be removed from that home. Right. Yeah. Like that's a tremendous sense of courage. And I think about your father and you paint a really fascinating picture of this man. But I think about sort of the ethics that you were, you know, sort of raised with. You're really like you're a very classic hero's journey kind of guy. Like when I think of Joseph Campbell and the hero's journey, like I picture your story, not the Matthew McConaughey that like, mm -hmm. you know, is famous and that like we see on the red carpet and all these things. But like the story that you tell is one of really finding yourself and your courage. A lot of it is around masculinity, but I don't find you toxic. So I'm curious kind of how you frame that sort of courage, especially because you are this very masculine dude and you're also a very thoughtful and very dedicated, sensitive artist. I know that's kind of a lot of questions in one, but talk a little bit about some of these journeys that, that you had. Well, let's go to that Australia one. The, the, to get the courage to say, to go to the Rotary Club and go to the president and go, hey, um, you think there's any other families I could live with? Um, and then they go, hey, yeah, I don't know. I mean, is everything okay over there? And to still take a high road and go, yeah, yeah, every, everything's, everything's fine, which it wasn't. But, but, you know, I just, I've got my year here. Can I experience another family? I don't think I would have had that courage if I wouldn't have got the clarity from the one event that I talk about in the book is when they said, call us mum and pup. And it, at that point, the prior four months of all the wild shit that they had come up with that I was like going, okay, I'll do that. Maybe that's a cultural difference. That one was clear to me. I was able to plant my flag have another binding anxiety and turn it into action and go, I'm binding this. No, I'm not calling you mom and dad. I have a mom and dad. And I remember saying this, I put this in the book, but I remember saying this, I'll go, I go, thank you for thinking of me that way. Um, <laughs> it's very polite, but, but I have a mom and dad. And I remember it going through my head clear. I, and I, I go, and I felt I need to contextualize that. I went, and they're still alive. <laughs> <laughs> for some reason, I felt I need to throw it out there that that would really bolster my argument. It's for not unlike being know. hit on by someone and being like, I appreciate you'd like to have sex with me, but I have a girlfriend and she's alive. <laughs> <laughs> and she's sitting right here. Um, yeah, so that moment was a moment that I needed because, again, I talk about up to that point, all the confusion, the things that, 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 that they want me to do that I didn't know was right. I was tabbing up to cultural differences. I didn't have anybody to bounce it off of. Like, is this cool? Yeah. I don't know. I didn't have that. I didn't have mom. I didn't have friends. All I had was the paper that I was writing on. So that moment to have the clarity and go, I'll bet, I'm betting on myself here. I'm, this is black and white. This is not a shade of gray. I'm not compromising on this. I'm going forward going, no, I'm not calling you mom and dad and I'm sticking to it. 
And I don't care if I'm wrong. I may end up broke. I don't care. I'm different. Hmm. Well, that gave me the courage to go, I'm going to try and get out of here and move in with another family. I'm not going to go home. I'm not going to pull the parachute and get the flight home, but I'm at least going to try and get out of this house. Um, I don't know. I mean, it gave me to go back to the ethics and ethos of certain, the religious underbelly. Responsibility, courage are kind of we're, we're ingrained in there in us and go, you better go take care, take care of yourself. Um, that was part of the masculinity. Step up to the initiation, go through the initiation. How long can you endure it? Can you step up and go, I am the only, I'm standing for this and I may be the only one standing for this, but I'm going, I'll go by hook or by crook. That was a big thing for my father. As you read another mm-hmm. rites of passage that I have from him, he's wanted to see that if, if I was, if I had the, the gall and the, 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 the courage to stand up for myself in certain We call situations. it chutzpah in my family. Chutzpah, all that, the, 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 the metal, the, the, uh, whatever, whatever it's called that. It, did I have it to stand up for myself when I was alone and everyone else disagreed? Hey, that was a rite of passage for him. Um, and in a way, you bring it up, I performed it over there in a couple ways in Australia and then literally performed it with him with that bar fight. Oh, that bar fight. Yeah. It wasn't, he wasn't happy that I was a f- fighter. He, he was just happy that I did something on my own, that I made the choice well, on and, my own. So let, let's, and, talk a, let's talk a little bit about the bar fight. Like I said, there's something very not toxic, a, sort of about the way that, that, that you talk about, you know, this kind of structure of, of how you were raised. And I resonate with it a lot because the culture that I come from is very, very patriarchal. There's a lot of, there's a lot of, because dad said so and dad decides and dad puts cash on mom's dresser every week and that's the cash she has for the week. And you know, like, you yeah. know, is very, very old fashioned. Um, but this bar fight, I remember what struck me and probably because I, I do feel a little bit like we're similar. It was that someone put their hand on your dad when they weren't supposed to. I remember seeing almost the, the fingers go from outstretched to mm-hmm. compressed lightly against his chest. And I was like, that was trespassing. Mm-hmm. That was, <laughs> get out the guards, we're going. And the next thing I knew, I'm getting pulled off here in a voice in my head going, that's enough, son, that's enough. And that Man. that's like where it got me when he said, that's enough, son, because like it's such a, it's such a fascinating moment. And it's not that that's the only way that you could show connection or love, but you know, this portrait that you paint of your dad, he, he was a very specific man, you know, he was very specific and very definitive. Y- your mom was too. Your, your parents were twice divorced and then they married each other. Three times. Right. Were you at, at any of the ceremonies? I was trying to figure no. out the timing. Okay, so the, fir- the first time they got divorced was like right out, like within a year, right? Pretty soon after, yeah, early 50s. Right. Yeah. Okay, and then the second one? Like 1977-ish. Okay, got it. That time when I was living in the trailer park with Dad and thought Mom was on the extended vacation. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah, she's taking some time. You grew up with a certain amount of drama, right? I mean, yeah, there was a yeah, yeah. I mean, we didn't call it that then. It was just... We didn't call it that, and we didn't right. give it the credit to call it drama. Right. Was, yeah, yeah, what, yeah. what, I mean, what was it? You know, I described, like, unpredictable predictability was my house. You know, it was predictable chaos is kind of how it felt sometimes. Um, Do you have sort of, you know, just for people who may not know, and a lot of it is in the book, but um, you know, you're, you're one of three boys. Yeah. What, what was it like? What did it feel like? Love hard. Look, I didn't include, and my mom, it's what what she doesn't like, what, what she didn't take well about the book. She was like, I, I, all the stories are true about me and your dad. And yeah, my middle finger is broke four times from him doing that. Mm-hmm. And I deserved every one of them. And that's how I needed to communicate. So she goes, but she could have included more stories about how loving we were mm-hmm. and how many times we were h- hugging it out. And I go, you're right. I, and I didn't. And that was 98% of the time yeah. we were loving it out. I didn't include those because for me, these stories, I think, this is the best I can come up with it, why I choose to tell these stories as the love stories for my family they were when the love was tested the most. It's, you thought it was gonna break down. You, I thought, we thought it was over. Or, or from objectively, you would think it was over. I never thought it was over when I watched the fight when mom pulls out the knife. I never thought that was the end. I thought, oh, here we go. I mean, Bloody. when the cops come, sometimes that's just how the evening ends. Uh, and, 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 and they didn't, you know, they handled it right there because, it, but it was always, it was drama looking back at it. But again, at the time, was I crying? Was I, oh my God, no, no. Right. Have I been on my dad's back 
when he, you know, had my brother pinned to a ceiling, <laughs> you know, with his feet kicking, going, stop it, dad, stop it. Yeah, but what do I remember? I remember that he had Pat up there because Pat lied to him. And once Pat got up, which is about off the floor about five minutes later, I remember him going, let's load in the truck, boys. Mm -hmm. And me and my brother and my dad rode in the front cab in the bench seat, me in the middle, windows halfway down, radio half off frequency, AC on, drove to the, all the way across town, it was 45 minutes, to the best burger stand there was in town, and it was a school night, it was after bedtime, but it didn't matter, we're getting doubles and you can have a milkshake. <laughs> That's what I remember, that it always ended with the love, the love always ended, and there was never another word talked, there was no grudge. There was never, uh, I remember what we said yesterday. It was over. It was quick, lethal, and over. You're a dad. You're a parent. And that shit doesn't fly anymore, right? And you say something really specific. I think it's page one. I literally said to Jonathan, I don't want to mention anything he mentions in the first two pages of his book because he'll think I didn't read every single word, and I did. <laughs> but you mention that you, you don't identify as a victim. No. But in the language of today, right, we would say, mm -hmm. Matthew, you were traumatized. That's a traumatizing sure. experience. And sure. I, I wonder now that you're a dad and especially, you know, you're a, a progressive person and, and, you know, what, how do you frame that as a dad? Because I do raise my kids differently than I was raised. I mean, my children's like, I, I also did something. Matthew, here's another thing you don't know about me. I recently wrote a screenplay and I directed my first film and it stars Dustin Hoffman and Candace Bergen and also Simon Helberg and Diana Agron. And I wrote a story about a family that is struggling with mental illness and with loving hard, one could say. And yes, there are absolutely things from my life. I do not want my mother to see it. She has not read it. We've already had several fights and a few therapy sessions about why I don't feel the need for her to see it, for some of the reasons you kind of talked about. But the things that I lived through, they, they don't need to be repeated that way because we do live in a different time and I have a different experience. And it doesn't mean I demonize my parents or my childhood, but I absolutely know that I was to a certain extent conditioned with fear because that's how we were raised. And it quote, works, it works. Yeah. And and it's it's a choice that I make to, to try not to do that with my kids, right? But at the right. same time, I don't want them to feel like everything about the way I was raised was shitty and wrong and right. it was bad and they traumatized me. These were complicated people who fucking did the best that they could. And like, that's kind of what it looked like. You know, they did better than was done to them Yep. And, you know, my grandparents fled Eastern Europe. Everybody was just doing the best that they could. And my parents did the best that they could. And you're absolutely right. The story that I tell is much more interesting when I dig into the hard stuff and I dig into that complexity and the conflict and that tension. And one of the notes I got from my, my director's cut was, this abuse seems gratuitous. And I was like, oh, well, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry that it makes you uncomfortable. But I wonder sort of what your perspective is as a dad. How do you frame that with your own kids? Well, my mother's been living with us now for 18 months because of COVID. <laughs> yeah, she and, is. <laughs> and she's about to turn 90. And, you know, like you said, I didn't grow. You, you, we grew up. In, why? Because I told you so. That's right. And fear-based. And I write about this, but are there things I didn't do that I shouldn't have done for fear that, oh, that ass whooping might hurt more than how much I'm going to enjoy doing this? Yes. And I'm glad I didn't. They were, I had other friends that did. I knew there were consequences on the other side. And that helped keep me in line in certain ways. Um, I didn't fear random, especially from my dad. I didn't fear any random. Like I said, every time I got in trouble, gosh, dog, and I look back, I knew it at the time I'd earned it. <laughs> I knew it. I knew I'd earned it. When I opened my you mouth know? and something fresh came out, I knew it was coming Ooh, back. You know, <laughs> um, I, I, you know, I've, I've tried to evolve as a, as a parent too. I don't, as you see the book, I don't judge my parents and how they did it is right or wrong or, oh, you can't do it that way anymore. I, I, I do try to, I'm trying to instill the same values my parents tried to instill in, in us. I try to do it in different ways. Um, do we have long or much longer discussions with our kids? Yes. 
Do we choose? Oh, they not have to so many the feelings, economy? children. Today, they got so many. I said, you oh, think God. anyone asked me where I'd like to eat out? We ate out oh. once a month, and you went wherever they told you, and you ate everything on the plate. You don't oh. feel like Chinese food. And no corn does not count as a vegetable <laughs> in the line at Luby's cafeteria. <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, so I, I we have uh, trying to instill the same values. Don't really do physical punishment and consequences. Mm -hmm. Try it's tough figuring out what do you take from them that they love to make them think, oh, I do you know, I got my screen time taken away. Why? Cause I did this or I told this fibber didn't fall. It's tough figuring those things out. It doesn't make Did sense you know? to them. If I fibbed, why are you take away my screen time? <laughs> yeah, what's the math? The math doesn't add up. <laughs> I used to say, how do you stop hitting? I can't cut off your hands. Like, I don't know what the logical consequence is. Don't hit your brother. No, cut it out. I, I, I hear you. Or you get hit back. Wow, that hurt. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's right. Um, you know, and it's quicker that way. And it's, it's, it's immediate. And it sure as hell is more than it can be at least an attention getter. <laughs> My and Bialik's Breakdown is supported by Away. Take me away, away. Away is a modern lifestyle brand that creates thoughtful products for every traveler and every kind of trip. Jonathan and I travel all the time. We can attest to this. Now, travel looks different than ever before, and you can count on Away's range of suitcases, bags, and accessories whenever you take whatever kind of trip you go on. I can't wait to visit Jonathan's parents in Toronto. We're all navigating the current reality of travel, and no matter your destination or style, Away's suitcases, bags, and accessories come in so many colors and sizes and materials, they will inspire your future travels. Away products are also designed to last a lifetime of trips to Toronto to visit Jonathan's family. If any part of your suitcase breaks, they have an amazing customer service team, and they will have it fixed or replaced for real. There's a 100-day trial on everything they make. If you decide it's not for you, return it, as long as it's not personalized. You get a full refund during that period. No ifs, ands, or asterisks. Away offers free shipping and returns on any orders within the contiguous U.S., U.K., Europe, and, that's right, Canada. Start your 100-day trial and shop the entire Away lineup of travel essentials, including their best-selling suitcases, at awaytravel.com slash mbb. That's awaytravel.com slash mbb. My MB Alex Breakdown is supported by Daily Harvest. I love it. When the sun sets later, the days are longer, I get more time outdoors, and I just get to live a little more. And we all know I need to live a little more. But all of the summer activity sometimes means that I have very little time to cook because I'm outside and not enough time to focus on eating foods that I know are good for me. And that is why I am so excited that Daily Harvest has become part of my life. It's part of my self-care routine. Daily Harvest is delicious meals, harvest bowls, flatbreads, we love the flatbreads, smoothies, and more, all built on organic fruits and vegetables right to your door. I really like the artichoke spinach flatbread. There's also a flatbread with kale and cabbage that blew our minds. Daily Harvest literally takes minutes to prepare. It never uses preservatives. There's no added sugar, artificial anything. And that goes for everything. Get more time back to do you and take care of yourself this summer. Go to dailyharvest.com and enter code BREAKDOWN to get up to $40 off your first box. That's code BREAKDOWN for up to $40 off your first box at dailyharvest.com. That's dailyharvest.com. <laughs> Camille and I are trying to do it different than than my parents did or even her parents did. Mm -hmm. um, and are we doing it better? I don't know. We'll see how we kids get out there and negotiate. Me and my two brothers have done all right, you know, with how my and my older brothers had it rougher than I did. Mm -hmm. I was the baby boy. I was more the mama's boy. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't have it as rough uh, as, as probably as they did. Well, and that's what they say. I would say <laughs> I learned to break the rules and get away with shit better. Um, <laughs> but you know, I mean. I'm already in this time now where my kids are 13, 11, and 8. Well, you start off, there's a there's a rule that every kid follows. That's it. Everyone follows the same rule. Then all of a sudden, they start becoming their own little people. And you got to go, wait, I'm going to treat you fairly, but I'm not going to treat you all the same because I know you, sir, if you forgot to feed the dogs, you actually looked at the empty dog ball and said... <laughs> Don't get away with it. But I know you, dear, you looked at the dog. You didn't look at the dog. You just freaking forgot. So the same <laughs> consequence is not for you because yours wasn't intentionally, you know, you didn't intentionally walk away from it and not do it. So 
I'm trying to customize those. How do we teach them? Uh, we are big on uh, consequences and also big on the definition of consequences gets a bad rap as always being the bad. Yep. Consequences are, have equal amount of being the good, the pleasure as well. Mm -hmm. um, we are a pretty disciplined family. Um, uh, we like our, we like, I like the manners and graces that my parents caught me with. I like sirs and ma'ams and please and thank you. Yeah, yous. I don't let my kids call any adult by their first name. Freaks me out. They are miss or mister. It's a, it's a, Make it's it happen. A, it's a great thing of res, res, respect. Um, I even call my kids Mr. and Mrs. Now, just to get in the lingo of going back and forth yep. um, and calling them out of respect. So we try to give them more agency. We listen to more debates than my parents would have listened to. Holy moly, will they stop talking some days. It's like, <laughs> I understand you have feelings, but that doesn't mean that they win. Yes, I understand you're in terrible psychic pain that they don't have the sweet potato fries. But I'm yes. not going to another restaurant. You're just no. not going to have fries tonight. No. I know. Yeah. Just not going to happen. Oh, now the, now it's over? Now the whole night sucks? Really? Because <laughs> no sweet potato fries? The sweet potato fries became more important than our time together. As a and then you, go, then you find yourself, and it's past bedtime, <laughs> and you're up late, and you're going, as you know, to say no is a hell of a lot harder than saying oh, yes. Oh, totally. Keeps you up at night, and all of a sudden it's getting into your time with your spouse, it's getting yep. time with your partner, they're staying up late. It's a, so, we, you know, another one we've tried here recently is like, one of the one of the kids doesn't listen to the rules. Okay, I'm gonna walk around and ignore you for a day. <laughs> Why? Because you ignored me. Jonathan does that to me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's 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 a quiet but 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 good one. It's uh, silent but what, deadly. You know, why, literally. You know? Yes. Yes. You know. Well, why didn't I? Why, why did? Why, why didn't I get a, a plate set? <laughs> <laughs> oh, didn't know you were here eating. Oh, why? Well, oh. <laughs> and, and you know how long that conditioning takes? One day. That's All a one right. day lesson. I hope so. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I'm trying to evolve and do it differently than my, my parents did. And, and, and again, with no judgment to saying that they did it wrong. You explained with your parents, I would use the same verbiage for mine. They did it the best they could and their intentions were right. And I know that it was really important to my mom and dad to go. We got 18 years to help you get ready to go negotiate life. Mm. And life's a bitch. Civilization's hard. Not everyone's for you. It's thorny out there. You're going to need a helmet. You're going to have to stand up for yourself. Get And so, you know, for what to what extent, a lot of that a lot of that worked. One of your kind of earliest thoughts, you know, about sort of where you see your life. I mean, there's some really there's some really sweet actual tidbits in your handwriting, which I really loved. And I love trying to decipher your, you know, your scribbles and stuff, especially when you really kind of got going. Um, but you wanted to be a dad. You knew you wanted to be a dad. Um, is it what you imagined? How's it different? How's it the same? When I had the first child, and I write about this, is, and I don't know how it is for, for the mother, but for the father, the man's never more masculine than that time when he has his first child. Again, for me, I was like, I'm immortal. Hmm. Like, literally, biologically, wow. Uh, I am now, immediately now, inherently instinctually living for the future where yesterday i wasn't i am a shepherd i'm a uh, postman and wherever i go out in the world they may not be with me physically but i got them right here and my decisions are based on consideration for them too and their future the second thing that i was what really surprised me which i think a lot of parents run into this is i thought it was a lot more environment <laughs> yes <laughs> Then it was DNA. It's and, a lot and of DNA. Was like, oh, DNA is the champ. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> biology. I got, I'm all for the giddy up, but the giddy up ain't beating the biology. Okay. They are who they are. You know, and we can shepherd them and form them, give them, lay in front of them what turns them on and try to keep from them what may ha really harm them and show how that feels good to them and how it's good for them and hopefully good for others. But boy, you know, other than that, they are, you know, you teach them. My buddy says what you teach them how to read and write and literacy after that. You don't know if they're petunia or an oak tree. I mean, you, 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 they, DNA, they are who they are. Um, and I, that was a big surprise for me as a parent. And I've heard that's a surprise to a lot of parents that I came in thinking it was a lot more like what we do as parents. Is Which is not to say you shouldn't pay attention and be there. No, absolutely not. No, you don't just go, Still gotta okay. Be there. Yeah, absolutely. But, you know, especially as they get older, and I said earlier, I'll treat you fairly, but not all the same. I see three different, completely different mm -hmm. individuals now where 
when they're younger and they're more of a young, you know, marshmallows, mom, whatever we want to call them, marshmallows. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> they're, they're, you know, you're trying to teach them to block and tackle and do the, and just you kind of get up and eat and food, clean up after yourself, that kind of thing. Uh, now it's, it's, it's very specific for Do you have one. one that's a, that's a mini you? Do you have a mini me? The, the, the boys, Camilla, would, it's easy for Camilla, my wife, to say. And she says, did you see that? I'm like, yeah, right. She's like, what are you, yeah, right about that? That's you. Like, <laughs> <laughs> um, and I get it, I see it in both of, of, of them a lot in completely different ways. Hmm. Um, uh, you know, eldest, uh, very much a perfectionist. Hmm. Uh, very much wants and is very clear about what he wants and has incredible debates about it. it takes <laughs> Take the coffee table with the microphone and has <laughs> slideshows. And you're like going, damn, that's a good argument. That's not what we decided to do, but yeah, that's a that's a great presentation. Um, so he's a he's got that to do whatever by hook or crook to get what he wants and has the marketeering sort of side, the salesman side. Um I got another one that's really wonderfully stubborn. They're both wonderfully stubborn. And I'm like, you know, you want to walk that line, I think, with kids I tried to to go. I'm glad you're a perfectionist because you're clear on what you want. At the same time, understand that you, the, the world can do unto you and you can also be open to, we were just having a conversation a minute ago about something about, you gotta try to, can, do you have the ability to, to hop into the opposite opinion and just understand it and just sit in it. It doesn't, I know what you're doing, you're getting scared thinking, well, if I think of that opinion as a possibility, <laughs> that means I'm weakening my, no, I'm not trying to convert you, but can you jump over? And that's something that kids learn to do and adults are still learning to do to talk about it, frankly. Um, so, yeah, I see a lot of myself in them. And if I don't, my wife reminds me that, <laughs> yep, right there, that was you. <laughs> I'd like to talk about what's behind you, because what I see is just stacks of money. Is that just stacks of money behind <laughs> You're you? You're the second person who said, you see, how much money's back there? Is that Those just are, how you do your interviews? Just like... Me, me and Floyd Mayweather, baby. <laughs> um... But there are two flags behind you. I believe yes. that is the flag of the, the United States of America. And is that the, the flag of the great state of Texas? That is. Where are you? Are you in and the right Capitol there, building? I'm in, my, I'm in my office in Austin. And those are stacks of money. <laughs> no, those are actually green light books. <laughs> uh, are you serious? That's amazing. Yeah, I love that symbol <laughs> under the cover. Take the cover yeah, off. Yeah, that's what I was on. noticing. The symbols, that's what's cool right there. So... I want, uh, that's my, you know, I was looking for my Nike swoosh with the book. And right. that's, I was, and I've always said this, that's why I made that cover of my face on it, three quarters, to hopefully to tell the reader, I pull, see. The, pull my face off the thing <laughs> and look under it. I mean, cool. if I had a nickel for every time I said, <laughs> sorry, okay, <laughs> sorry. Jesus. I think I'm your new brother from another mother. I think Woody Harrelson needs to move over. Scoot over, Wood. Um, uh, so do, do you talk, I mean, we can completely edit this out if not, but do you talk about some of the, the buzz surrounding your yeah. possible? Oh, so yeah. please, please tell us, I would vote for you for president, but there's a couple steps before that, correct? Logically, maybe. <laughs> Um, you, you, you do have political inclinations as it were. Is this something you talk about? I, t I have leadership inclinations and less than inclinations. I feel like I'm being pulled that way. I feel like it's when my, you know, my Saturday night, 2 AM buzzed ideas go to places where I look at it and go, that's, that's, I think that'd be good for people. I think that'd be useful. It's my natural free association mind goes to things naturally and has been for um, quite a few years now. I don't know what that category embassy is going to be. Do I need to consider politics for that? Well, I'd be foolish not to. Yeah. But it's in a way politics got to repurpose, redefine because it's some small thinking right now. It, it's both each party thinks they are democracy mm. <laughs> and they're not. And then democracy still needs continual redefinition. Um, it needs its own challenging. Um, so I'm looking and I'm going through my own process now and have been diligently of going, well, what is my embassy? What is my way forward? What is, how can I be most useful, not only to most amount of people, but to me and my family as well? Because it's got to be a selfish decision. It's a very personal decision that would come with great sacrifice. Um, but I gotta, I'm got i trying to measure that. Where would I be most useful? Mm -hmm. To myself, my family, and the most amount of people. Now, would that be politics? I don't know. It's a bit of, it's a, bit of a broken business that needs a lot of repair right mm -hmm. now. Um, and as I said, redefinition, um, 
And so, am I the right person to do that? Is that sort of the task? Are you asking me? I think Consider so. I'm, I'm asking the either. <laughs> are you, are you a, asking it's, for her it's, it's, as your running mate? I would be it's, here. A, it's a binding anxiety. <laughs> oh, stop it. Never going to let me live it down. Oh, Matthew, oh, when I see you at all our red carpet parties, you'll say, finding anxiety. Um, <laughs> you, you, do, you do a lot of really interesting, also, other things. You, you do hold a professorship, as it were. Yep. Um, what, what is your time commitment for that? Like, how, how often do you do that? It's, 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 it's very, it, it, it works with me very well. I have a, a professor that's in there daily named Scott Rice, who really has taken my baton of the class I created and runs it day to day. Um, I go by the classes in person and or I Zoom. I'm able to Zoom in more to, uh, to talk to the class. What we do is take, it's called script to screen. We'll take, like your, your script, your, your movie you just directed. Mm-hmm. You put up your original script next to your movie. Wow. Well, they're, different. they're very different. Right? So what we do is we'll go, I would say come to you and go, I have a class. It's a full semester. Can you share your first script? And with notes about here's what I What? Hope. Then they, the kids get up and they declare, here's what movie I see, here's the drama, here's the thing. You hand them the second script. Wait, what happened to so-and-so? What are these changes? Do we know why? You hand them the third, you hand them the shooting That's script. That's amazing. Then you show them a first assembly. Now they think they're going on. I'm with literally the, then you editing. show them the final cut. I'm editing literally in the next room. Before I got here, I was editing, and that's what I'm going to do later today. I'm literally, I just did my first cut. I'm working on my second. That's And it's a complete, I'm totally making the actors do everything I wanted that they didn't do in person. Yeah. But it's a totally right. different movie, yeah. And then you talk about that, and it's just the many ways to skin the cat. Like every movie, how do you? Because you know, I was in film school, and I thought it was a dictatorship. I thought, oh, you make a film, it has to be every word for word. The intentionality has to be super clear. Well, I was closed off to magic and inspiration. Then I go work with Richard Linklater, and he's very much like, we'll take an idea from anywhere. And I was like, oh, you can get great ideas and be open to inspiration anywhere along the way. And I saw a completely different way of making movies in a much more successful way. So it's a class that shows, puts the science behind the magic of how we get, how we that's tell stories. Really, that's beautiful. And I also do want to mention your Just Keep Living Foundation. Tell us, um, tell us about it because I we're gonna post you sure. know links and stuff so people can learn we, more about it. We have it. an after school curriculum in Title One schools. Title One schools are lower income schools through the United States. We're in a little over forty schools in I think nine states. I have a curriculum on Tuesdays and Thursdays, and these young men and women come and they set a physical exercise goal, which may be I want to make the soccer team, but I can't run half a mile. Okay. It may be I want to lose three pounds so I can fit my prom dress in two months. Whatever that is, we're gonna help you kind of get that. We had nutritional goals. Hey. You went and spent 42 bucks on burgers last night? Great. We're, we're all for burgers, but we're going to take you and your mom or your dad to the supermarket with the same 42 bucks. Mm. We're going to walk down the produce section, grab some beans, maybe some meat. We're going to come home, have a healthier dinner, and you get to cook it with your family. <laughs> we also have community service. They all have to give back to their community. And then the final sort of halo over our, our curriculum is, grat- is gratitude. Mm. The, the, the students share something out loud they're thankful for in their life with each other. And as you know, uh, with, 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 with your neuro uh, education, sharing what you're thankful for when you're in high school ain't cool. <laughs> <laughs> so these kids thought that when we first started off, they were like, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm thankful for the Just Food Foundation. Blah, blah, blah. They'd mumble stuff. And then all of a sudden I was like, ah, they, they're feeling this is really heavy, that they have to tell something dramatic and real. And I, Camille and I went one day and I was like, got to me. And I was like, I'm thankful I woke up this morning. I got a French kiss from my wife right when I woke up. And they all went, ooh, ah. But it opened the floodgate. And it made them go, oh, I'm happy Halloween's coming. I'm going to get candy. I'm happy I'm feeling sexy today. Now, once that happened, they started to share things like that. My grandmother got out of the hospital. That my dad got a job. That my sister's now healthy. And they share it. And the coolest thing we've heard about it is... Kids say their favorite thing about the, the, the gratitude circle is that for the first time in their life, they're hearing their peers say thank you for something that they have in their life mm. that they've never said thank you for. So that's what we're doing. That's really beautiful. Um, we have a little rapid fire set of questions. Great. Okay. I thought we were in that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Such a comedian. All right. Rapid fire questions. Ah. What was your mother right about? <laughs> My mother was right about the fact that there's great value in denial if you really commit to it. (laughs) Take it to your grave. Holy Toledo. What was your father right about? In an intimate time, he told me this when I was 
12, we were having our birds and bees talk. He said, you're going to be at an intimate time with the girl. You're going to like a girl. You're going to get off. You're going to get off saying, have some time together. You are going to kiss. And it may go further than that. It may move to here. We talked about it. And he goes, it may carry on. He goes, those are the stages that that intimacy goes through. He goes, when you're with whoever that girl is, if you feel them hesitate, don't go any further. He goes, and he goes, and what happens if you don't go any further is they may even go, oh, yeah, no, it's okay. Don't. Wait till next time. Mm. And then, but, but if, there's, if there's a reflex to stop the forward momentum of the intimacy, stop then. Mm. Live, to, live, to, live to love another day. Huh. Um, and, he, and, and it was a good one uh, when I think back about it. Nice. It's one I'll, one I'll share with my, my kids. Location you've been in that promotes the best mental health for you. Oh, I love desert. I love the desert. You, you have a lot of little sayings. You're so Southern. But what's your favorite mantra? Uh, my favorite mantra? Let me give you a real Southern one. Because this came from a Southern <laughs> man. A 92-year-old There's going to be a lot of apostrophes in this. There's going to be a lot oh, of mm's. There won't be any G's on the end of any of the <laughs> I-N's. Um, the G's are all behind you, Matthew. They're lined up on that table. Sorry. Dude, all the G's, me and Floyd, money, make them load them up. <laughs> Lopez truck is out front. <laughs> um, okay, mantra. <laughs> uh, if there's one thing you can depend on people being, it's people. <laughs> Perfect. Um, who has been your best spiritual teacher? Pastor Dave and Brother Christian. Mm-hmm. They are in your book. Yeah. Who are you most competitive with? Me. <laughs> um, last one. One of the really remarkable things that um, I loved in this book and that I love about you, I, I promise, I really learned so much about you from this book, um, and especially because I'm trained as an actor, but, you know, write and, you know, just directed for the first time. You have a tremendous sense of intuition. You have a tremendous sense of intuition and when you need to make a move, when you feel something with most passion. Your last rapid fire question, when has been your moment of your best and strongest intuition in your life? She was moving right to left from my eye line. The place was kind of fuzzy, and not just because there was fake smoke coming from the floor. The <laughs> amount of tequila I had in me had something to do with it. I had these caramel arms that had a little bit of sheen on them, just a touch of humidity coming out of this turquoise dress. And I said, what is that? <laughs> and as I said it, I started to get up, but then I said I'd try to catch her eye, and I'd wave to get her attention. And as I was waving to get her attention, I heard my mother in my 15-year-old ear going, get your ass up, boy, and go introduce yourself to that woman. You don't wave this woman over. From and I went, yes, ma'am. And I got up and I went over <laughs> myself to who is now the mother of my children and my wife, Camille. That's beautiful. Um, this has been an absolute pleasure. I don't know what favor you were repaying to come speak to us, but we are so thrilled. It's been a real honor to speak to you. It was super fun and interesting. Let's do it again. You crack some good jokes. I make Matthew McConaughey my best friend. I, I think Woody Harrelson is a little bit in the way we have to... I think I make Matthew laugh more than Woody does. We should have a contest. We'll get both of them in the same room with you and see who does a better job. I'm very proud of myself. He did a great job. I barely have seen movies that he's in. I've seen like two movies, but I love them. I think I did a good job not mentioning Dazed and you, Confused. If this man has not said, all right, all right, all right, every day for the last month, I don't even know what that is. Do it. You do it cute. No, I won't do, do it. No. no. How do you say it? You, all right, all right, all right. What do you do? That is not how it's done. All right, all right, all right. You clearly haven't seen the movie. I haven't. Is that for? Is that the Link Letter film? All right, all right, all right. That is the cannot be how he says it. <laughs> no, it's probably not it either. But that's a classic movie. It's un that He seems very famous. He has a very famous... See, movie stars are very different than TV? than TV stars. I once saw Emma Stone on an airplane. We were both in first class. And she she just has like an air about her. It's like the movie stars are different. He's just like, he's different. TV actors bring their lunch pails to work. <laughs> Okay, pretend you're a movie star for a minute. How does I it, don't. How does it? How, he sit. <laughs> he's got very good posture. Very good posture. He's very confident. Like, 
I'm sure that he's got his moments, and I read his book. Like he sure has his moments, but like I don't think I don't think he cries like I do. <laughs> no one cries like you do. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't mean to like fangirl out and be like starstruck because the fact is, look, let's just be honest. He's a person just like you're a person, just like, you know, the person experiencing homelessness when I drive off the freeway. Like, we're all just people. We're all just here. But, he's, but <laughs> he's, he's very different because he's different. Well, he has, he's composed. He has, an, he has an, a, co a very collected energy about him. There's something very handsome about him besides just like, oh, he has classically attractive features. Like his present, he has a very, it, you know, it's confident. And he is, he's very, you know, I, I hope people weren't upset or triggered by his his and my conversation about masculinity because, you know, that that is obviously a gendered term and it's not just reserved for men. There are women who have masculine, like it's totally good and all good. But he really is like a very, you know, he's America. I don't know that this is a fact, but he's one of the most photographed people with his shirt off. That's not true. In, in tabloids, yeah. There's like he a, is? There's a running joke that Matthew McConaughey never has a shirt on in Shut pictures. Shut up! There, okay, you don't go on the internet I don't much. do things. There's a lot of pictures of him here. He does have his shirt off. I mean, if I had a body like that, I would never put on clothing. No, there's like, if you Google it, there's running jokes on late night. Oh, I didn't that know. he never, like he doesn't own shirts. <laughs> And there's pictures of him and Woody without their shirts. They're like total, he's like the shirtless guy. I didn't know that. I mean, there's jokes that uh, he had to like put a shirt on to drive his Lincoln. That's when he, <laughs> the only time. Well, he... I saw him in Dallas Buyers Club, which is a really, really, a very significant, Im important film um, about um, HIV and a very specific time in, in history. And he, he plays this unbelievable character. And he actually talks about in the book, like, you know, at that time in his career, he was switching over from the movies that everyone knows Matthew McConaughey from to the movies that I know Matthew McConaughey from. And, like, no one thought he should make it. And he lost all this weight for the role. Weight, yeah. And, like, he's very... I didn't want to, like, talk act. I mean, I wanted to talk everything with him, but... I don't know if method acting is something that he kind of talks about, but he really does talk about like being in character and he has a story of something that he like didn't even study the script for this job because he like wanted to just like be in it and then he gets to set and finds out he's supposed to speak Spanish <laughs> and like <laughs> give a whole monologue in Spanish. And he's like, oh my gosh, like so much for like trying to be in the moment. But anyway, um, that's the like the shirtless image I have of him is from Dallas Buyers Club when he was, I mean, I it's think he was like 130 pounds or something, like yeah. really, really... Very, very thin. Um, no, he. we didn't get to ask him about hair. There's a great anecdote in the book. Tell us about it. <laughs> he was going to shave his head. He has amazing hair. He has way. beautiful hair. He was, he was starting to lose it. And so he decided. No one believes that. He, <laughs> that's what he said. And he decided to shave it. And It's also a wives' tale. I, and, and what was it? How did he phrase it? There's an aboriginal handshake. <laughs> And the the man said, if two people believe, what is it? If two people believe something, like, it becomes true. Like, if they believe it deeply enough. And then his hair was fine. So you're telling me that this could have been prevented. We don't believe it enough that it's going to be okay. Oh, maybe it'll come back. What do we believe together enough that we're going to make it true? That we're going to last as a couple. <laughs> but even that is like... <laughs> No, there's there's a lot about his hair. In addition, you know, he like almost lost a job because of it. And then like the director saw him in person was like, oh, just kidding. You're still stunning. Everything's fine. <laughs> I do very highly recommend this book because he really it's it's not a memoir like you think. And he really does cover we didn't get into a tremendous amount of like mental health per se. But I mean, all of our lives are a journey. Of, of mental health or of challenges, you know? And he has this running line of persistence and spontaneity and, and courage. And like, I don't know if he's fearless, but he lives as if he is fearless. I know that not everyone has the resources to be like, I had this dream about, you know, the Amazon and I'm gonna go there. But, you know, he's done some beautiful things. And it's funny, when we asked him about his Just Keep Living Foundation, when he opened his mouth, I was like, are we going to get like a little sound bite here? Which is fine. But then when he started talking, I was like, this is a man who really is articulating solutions to some really prominent challenges. 
you know, at schools all over this country. And I really, I do, I admire that. I don't, it's not lips. I don't feel like it's lip service. Like it's really, really lovely. The things he was saying, he wasn't just like, we're giving money to support after school programs. He was giving real examples. Like I was very, very impressed by him. And I know people are going to be like, he's just a rich celebrity, but no, I was really impressed by him. He's clearly- I made him blush. Can we talk about that? We can. He's clearly guided by uh, a deep intuition. And, and we talked a little bit about spirituality and being guided by sort of what he called a direct line and a direct line of truth. Uh, I think that's like clearly... I mean, it's a, it's a very religious concept and I didn't want to poke him about it because I don't think that this is the time Because we're not friends place. like that yet. Well, no, but I... The next I, time he comes, no, we'll, but I didn't, we'll book two hours. I, I didn't want to, I didn't want to poke that, not, not now. He said, let's do it again. I think he meant it. But what... What I do think is interesting is that, like, I've been taught that dreams are symbolic. <laughs> like, I, not him. Let's let's pick a dream that I could have woken up and been like, must pursue this. Like, are there donkeys with wings? Let me go <laughs> find them. <laughs> do you have a recurring donkeys with wings dream? I do. This is the first I'm hearing about this. Name me a dream of yours that you think maybe we shouldn't take literally. I mean, I fly sometimes. I have a recurring flying dream. Right. Never flown. I mean... Is it, do you have a better example, bro? I mean, I had a recurring dream that actually came true, but I didn't go pursue it. What? Whoa. I had a recurring dream about the town of Ashland that I wrote to you about and I told you about that I showed up and it was like this extremely distinct uh, place and the geography was is what made it so specific. There was like a river uh, next to a downtown area and... and um, I ended up in this town in 2018. In real life. In real life. I walked downtown for the first time and I was just struck. I was hit so hard by this recurring dream that I had had. I had it about like once a week for several years. Okay, that's weird, babe. And then... You're telling a weird story. I mean, weird in a good way, but I feel like that's a little bit of a different story. It's a I recurring dream. I was looking for dream. like, I once dreamt that I joined the circus, but I didn't do it. Instead, Jonathan's like... I speak to the universe and it sends me messages of where I should live. <laughs> like, that's a different story. Well, this was not necessarily permanent living. On, I was on this road trip in the dream and <laughs> I was arguing with my then uh, partner and we got to this town. We pulled over on like uh, on this road trip. And is we, this real life or the dream? This is the dream. <laughs> and then we parked there and I just turned to her and I'm like, can we rest here a little while? And like, there was so much tension in the car. From Cut to we live here now. We do, but I don't think we're living there forever. Uh, and it, okay, this, I had forgotten about that dream. This just took a turn. I had totally forgotten about that dream until I then walked in that downtown. And I hadn't had it for like five years, that dream. But I was like totally struck. I'm okay. like, holy shoot. This is the location of Canadians the dream. Canadians also don't curse. That I had been having for years and years prior to that. And it like totally freaked me out. Do you think that it's going to require another wet dream for Matthew McConaughey to run for office? Like he's going to have a wet (laughs) dream and he's like, yep, I'm supposed to be governor of Texas. No, but I do think in all seriousness, I mean, again, I'm not saying he's a prophet, but this notion of. But he has the hair for it. No, but this notion of, you know, what if we received information that we get with that kind of seriousness? Meaning to say, what's the message here? Like, what am I supposed to do? And he. I also really respect, you know, public people, famous people, you know, who are not afraid to say, like, I have a relationship with God and like this happened. And I believe that was like that. I really I think that's really cool. He also said he put himself in the place to receive that information. And so if we want to go there, I would posit that everyone has the ability to receive direct information of truth, whatever. Totally. We understand truth. to. We don't know how to listen or receive like people used to. So, So. So many of us are not putting ourselves in the position, not making space in our lives. And it's like also it's, you know, you call it serendipity or like coincidence. But, you know, that's just the lens that that we see it with. If people want to tell us about their serendipity moments. Or moments of moments of great intuition, we would love to hear that. I think that's fascinating. Tag us on Instagram at Bialik Breakdown. That's our Instagram page. This was a very exciting episode. Before we go, Mime, talk to us a little bit about gratitude. I have an attitude of gratitude. He talked a l- he talked about attitude of gratitude. He talked about um well, before he talked about well, attitude of gratitude, he talked about quick lethal and over, which is might be the episode title. It's also the title of our memoir. <laughs> but 
tell us why gratitude is helpful. We've talked a little bit about it, this in, a, in an Ask Why I'm Anything, but you know, this is less of an Ask Why I'm Anything and more of a uh, little why gratitude is so good for us. One of my favorite things that we do here at Mind Alex Breakdown is to break down the science behind things that people don't often know have science that relate to mental health. And gratitude is one of them. And, you know, I'm kind of allergic to positivity, meaning like yeah, I'm you not. hate when I'm positive. <laughs> no, I'm just like, I, I wouldn't say I'm like an optimistic, positive person. Like, that's just not, it's not my vibe. I was kidding, by I, the way. You like no, positivity. But, uh, no, I, I do, but um, I much more resonate with gratitude and an attitude of gratitude, which... Because there can be false positivity, which is a whole other problem. Yeah, and like, I'm I'm very, I'm just, it, it's me, it's not you. You know, I'm very sensitive to to false positivity or to kind Spiritual of... Spiritual bias. No, or like, like super, sometimes it can feel superficial to me or it can feel inauthentic. But what's interesting is that um, there have been some really interesting studies, scientific studies about gratitude. And some of the things, you know, you can kind of dismiss if you'd like to. I mean, the, the studies report, there was a study of, I think, 300 college students that was done. Um, and, you know, they found that, like, depression markers decreased when people were asked to, like, write, write gratitude letters every day and things like that. Um, but enter functional MRI machine. That's right. FMRI is our friend. And there have been gratitude studies that have been done when people are in an MRI scanner. And I'm happy to des describe what an MRI scanner does another day. My undergraduate thesis, we used functional MRI. Um, it's, it's showing blood flow and brain activity. And there are things that we can infer, infer from the, the patterns that we see and the changes in blood flow and, and therefore oxygen delivery to different parts of the brain. And Gratitude seems to um, seems to activate the medial prefrontal cortex, which is generally associated with learning and decision making. So the idea is that when when we experience gratitude, when we express gratitude, our brain is is rewiring in some ways. And I'm not saying that as like a, the brain can rewire. I'm literally talking about when you express and have access to things that you can be grateful for, even if, fill in the blank, it allows your brain to start learning and accepting and being open in a new way. And that's one of the things that 12-step programs in particular are big on is gratitude lists, you know? When you wake up, can you be grateful about three things? Without feeling guilty about it, without feeling like, oh, but also this is going on and I shouldn't be... You have a right to experience gratitude, and it is. It's good for your brain. And it can be little things, too. That's what people don't understand. They're totally. like, oh, I, my life has to be perfect in no, order no. to have gratitude. You know what my list sometimes sounds like? Cats. <laughs> just that they exist. Just cats. Patience. I often just have gratitude for patience. The gift of pausing is something all I can like get my head around in the morning. I'm just grateful that I've learned that I don't have to instantly react to everything. I'm grateful for the gift of recovery, that I can experience things bigger than myself. But those notions of gratitude, it does, it puts a different lens on your day. So yeah. The, the last thing about this interview that we just did. Because everybody's like, nobody wants to listen to you. We just heard Matthew McConaughey. Is that Matthew talks about not raising his voice. And that I connected to that by pausing. I don't know why I'm getting that face. Because you shouted at me the other day. <laughs> There's no evidence of that. <laughs> If he gets to a point of needing to raise his voice, what he says is that he hasn't dealt with th other things that are contributing to him boiling over and that the thing Hundo. that he's yelling at Hundo. is not actually upsetting the most best, of the time. The best example is with my children. And I was a yeller. I was a yeller in some of their early years and I have tremendous, tremendous sadness and regret about it. But I, I took a parenting class. Uh, it's called Quality Parenting, and it's a kind of a progressive, you know, a lot of people in the holistic community, uh, well, we took it together, a group of girlfriends of mine. Um, we took it together. And what it said is that anytime you lose your patience, not just with a child, but with any human being, it is always because you do not have the patience to deal with whatever it is that's in front of you. Meaning, people can try and get their needs met, children especially, in ways that are annoying, that are frustrating. But I can have my child behave and do the same exact thing on a good day and a bad day. And the only thing that's different is me. That's the baseline of overall stress that has either accumulated or that we haven't managed Correct. in other ways. And so that's an he amazing said, sign. What have you? what have I not dealt with that's, that's right. coming out now? And so much of what we talk about is being aware enough to 
deal with the stuff that is in front of you that you're holding on to that you're yep. experiencing and having the tools to do so. My, I'm very grateful for learning new tools every day that we do this podcast. Well, thank you. But all the guests that we get to speak to, people that we, I would never otherwise get to talk to. Jonathan, I'm grateful that we get to do this podcast together. It's really lovely. I'm also grateful for all the listeners that um, really seem to appreciate it. They, they message us. <laughs> The, Most of them. We get a couple of... I'm grateful for our awesome team. I'm grateful for our friends at Rabbit Grin. Scott, who's sitting here today, and Jeff, who's out there. We have a really nice support team, and, and they Valerie, do all the technical stuff. Valerie, who's been stuff. helping us, and it's Bryce, and It's just a and gratitude and fest. Gabe, everyone. From our grateful breakdown to the one that we hope you never have, except the gratitude part. We hope you have that. We'll see you next time. It's Maya Bialik's breakdown. She's going to break it down for you. She's got a neuroscience PhD or two.